downstairs. Good morning and welcome to worship. I'm so excited that our student choir is going to lead us in worship today, so we're glad they're here. If you are new to JCBC or you're a guest, we want to welcome you here and get to know you. So we do that in a really easy way here. There is in the pew in front of you a little card. It says welcome. It's blue. Open it up, fill it out with your information. You can either put that in the offering plate later in the service or... Better yet, give it to one of the pastors at the end of the service, because we want to get to know who you are. Speaking of new members, we have two new members that we're so excited to welcome to JCBC. Would you join me in welcoming Warren and Gail Neal? So we have a lot of exciting things coming up in the month of October. At the end of the month, on the 29th, we'll be celebrating our 30th anniversary here on the campus in Johns Creek. So we want you to be a part of that. And as a part of that, we want you to tell us your story. You can go online to jcbc.org, click the little logo that looks like this, and tell us your story. Tell us your story of your faith life and how you've grown. Tell us your story of your life at JCBC and what it's meant to you, but tell us your story. And we'll use that in some creative ways on the 29th. So we look forward to that. This afternoon, right here in the same room at 4 p.m., we'll have Milligan Borough Hall's ordination service. And we want you to be a part of that. This afternoon, 4 p.m., Milligan is our former youth ministry intern, and we're excited to ordain her to gospel ministry. Also, next Sunday afternoon, mark your calendars for the JCBC Jamboree. It's going to be a great time in the FLC. All ages are invited, hosted by the Children's Ministry. It'll be a great time. Food, fun, games, dancing. You're going to want to be there. On Thursday, uh, October 26th, we have the Senior Ladies Fellowship. And it's open to all women, but it's hosted by the Senior Ladies, and you can register online for that. Finally, men, we haven't forgotten about you. We're having a men's pancake breakfast and prayer. And <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, and prayer on November 4th. So we want you to be there that Saturday morning. Again, you can register online at jcbc.org. So all that to say, we have a whole lot going on this month, but for now, let's prepare our hearts to worship the Lord together.
you. Thank you. Thank you, students. Thank you so much. Don't you want to give them another thank you just for leading us in worship this morning? <laughs> Wonderful. <clears throat> now we all have a story to tell of God's grace in our lives, so let's stand together and worship the Lord as we sing. Oh, hold on. Can we baptize and then celebrate the grace? <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Thank you very much. Pastor Annie? Thank you. Hello, I am so glad to be able to introduce to you all Rachel Smith. Rachel was a part of our children's ministry here and is now becoming part of our youth ministry. And I am so excited to continue to watch her grow. And today she has decided to be baptized, to tell all of you, her church family, that she is ready to follow Jesus, that she has given Jesus her heart and her life. And we are, I literally could not be happier <laughs> to be on this journey with you. And I think that many people or probably our whole church feels the same way. So if you are here and you are part of Rachel's family or you taught her in Sunday school or went to camp with her, prayed with her or her parents at any point during her life, will you please stand? And um, will the whole church now stand? Rachel, this is your church family. We are here for you. We are here with you. We see you and we love you. And we believe in the work that God is doing in your heart and in your life. Right here in this moment, but also in the future moments to come. And we know that following Jesus, there are some days that are hard. And there are some days that are easy. And we as your church family are here to walk with you and support you on the hard days. And we're also here to celebrate with you and rejoice with you on the good days. Whatever days are to come, we are here for you. You are not alone. And even more importantly than all of us, you have your Savior Jesus with you, walking alongside you each step of the way. Thank you, church. You can be seated. So, Rachel, do you come today to make this decision on your own free will? And what is your profession of faith? Jesus is Lord. Amen. Jesus is Lord. So, Rachel, upon your profession of faith, I baptize you. Go ahead and grab my hands. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Rachel, Jesus says that we are the salt of the earth. We can give the world flavor. We can preserve and help those around us. Jesus also said that we are the light of the world. So take this light and let the light of Christ shine in you and through you as you go throughout this journey. These are the waters of baptism. May we remember our Savior and give glory to him as we continue in worship today. So as I'm about to talk about grace, aren't you glad when you make a mistake, there's grace? <laughs> there's mercy and there's grace from God and from each other, and I thank you for that. We're going to focus in on celebrating the one who can change darkness to light and open up the realms of heaven to our lives as we concentrate on him. Would you now stand and let's sing together. Who brings a gift? We're going to start once again, please. We're going to start again. We're, we're having a few sound problems today. We're going to get the guitar and the piano in right at the top. Whenever you're ready. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. 
seem like they're out of order, but he brings it back together for us. Here we go. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of all peace. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the Serves all of our praise. All together, church. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Say it again. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Thanks, church. Give him, give him thanks and praise today. Amen. Wow. We have a story to tell. We're going to sing of his amazing grace all together. Twas grace that taught 
His promises are good and true. to hear all of our voices together praising your name, God, to know that you are forever ours, God. We pray that this morning, no matter what's going on in our lives at home, in our lives in our community, and in the life of the world, we can remember that you love us, God. Help us to focus on you this morning and grow closer to you so that each and every day of our lives are shaped to be more like you. Amen.
moment his hand has had mercy for all the love he's shown in my life a simple thanks doesn't say the nature and character of God that can only be known through your personal story, your singularly unique life experience, the beautiful, the brutal, and everything in between. In your story, your toils, joys, conflicts, triumphs, and sufferings, you learn who He is. No one can fully know the mind of God. He is the unfathomable depth, the inexhaustible mystery. Yet this indescribable, uncontainable one has chosen to be known by you in the unexpected intersection of your life and God's. And here's the scandal of it all. If you never tell your story, There is something about the contours of God's love the rest of us may never know. But if you do, if you find a way to bear witness to what you have seen and heard, if you can learn to give voice 
to what you have experienced in and with and through God. The more fully the world may know. This is my story. The grace and the peace of our Lord be with all of you here today. I want to invite you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Make that chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to get there in just a moment. Before we do, friends, we must pray. It is time to be in prayer for our world and for all that is happening in Israel today. I reached out to my friend, Rabbi Jordan, who is a friend of yours as well. He's been here with us. We've been there at the synagogue. And what can we do, Jordan? What do you need? And he expressed to me that there is, there is deep pain, no surprise, but deep pain in the broader global Jewish community. Fear, uncertainty, not just about what's happening in the land we call holy, but also in the uh, the reverb, the vibrations, the, 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 the impact this has on Jewish communities around the world. He said, we can start by calling this what it is, which is terror. Terror. And to call out terror where we can see it. And to pray for those who are displaced, but pray for the larger global community. To pray for the innocents on both sides. And so we stand with my brother, Jordan, and his entire faith community here in Johns Creek and beyond, but we commit to pray. I want to challenge you to do one thing, and then I want us to pray. Learn about the history of what has led to this moment. There are some amazing resources through the History Channel. There are some amazing resources that give us a little history of how we have come to where we are today. And that should shape how we pray for those who are suffering today. So in this next moment, before we turn to the word, would you join me um, in just a simple moment of intercession and lamentation for our, our global community, but specifically those in Israel right now? Let's pray. God, we lament this day. We grieve. We call out with the words of the ancients, why, O Lord, and how long, O Lord? We don't understand why it is that it seems as if evil prevails in a world where so many are working at peacemaking, and yet... Our questions remain, why, O oh Lord, and how long, O oh Lord? Today, we pray for those who are most vulnerable, those who have been dislocated, those who have lost lives, those who have lost family members, those who are now refugees running for their lives in places where they have no options where to go for hospitals that are overrun, for healthcare workers who are overwrought. We pray for your abiding presence. We pray for the vulnerable, those who are young and those who are old, those who are sick, those who are disabled. We pray for those who are afraid today. We pray that violence would end. We pray that even in roadways and highways that are leading refugees to safer places, we pray because we recognize those bottlenecks create more vulnerability to further violence and further attack, and we speak against it, Lord. We cry out that you would neutralize the powers of tyrants who would seek to make those who are most innocent suffer. 
We pray that you would bind up the broken, and we pray, Lord, for Jews and Muslims, both who are suffering during this season, those without water and electricity, those without food, those without shelter, as we are so very grateful for the the blessings that we enjoy this day, the freedom to gather, the safety in which to gather together, and, and we pray that that grace would be extended to them this day. We pray for our Christian brothers and sisters living there in Gaza. We pray that they would be a light to the nations. We pray that they would remember our roots, that our Lord who walked those very lands called them to be peacemakers, to be a light in the midst of darkness, to host those who are hurting, to bind those who are broken. We pray for our sisters and brothers in the faith that they may be a presence that is nothing more than, nothing less than, and nothing other than your holy presence in that chaos. Lord, as all hell seems to break loose, we pray that you who hold the keys to hell may prevail as the king of peace in this day. For their sake, for our sake, and for the sake of your kingdom, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, beloved, I turn your attention, I'd like to call your attention to the second book of Corinthians, chapter 11. You know that we are now in a series of conversations about what it means to to tell our story. That the reality is every one of us has a story. Your life is telling a story, whether you want it to or not, (laughs) whether you know it or not. It may be a good story, bad story, happy story, sad story, exciting story, boring story. It's telling a story. Everywhere that you give your energy, your attention, your love, your affection, it's telling the world a story about what you value most. And what I said the first week together is that your life, my life, is a subplot in the grand meta-narrative that God has been telling from the very beginning. And if we learn to tell our story then the rest of the world gets a little bit clearer glimpse of the majesty of a God who would meet even us right where we are. Last week, I talked to you a little bit about how to tell the story because I don't believe that those of us who have been rescued by God, I don't believe we don't want to tell the story. I don't believe that we somehow have a problem with telling how grace has lifted us up. The trouble is we don't know how to. And so last week, I talked to you very practically about how to pray about it, how to keep it real, about how to tell your story in three stages, my life before, my decision to follow, and my life since. I talked about how you need to write it down, and some of you have taken my invitation to send me your stories, and I am humbled and grateful to see a glimpse into the heart of God by hearing you tell your story. And today, I want to carry that that powerful message and powerful invitation forward by telling you a story. Years ago in southern Florida, a true story of a young boy who got home after school and he wanted to take a dip in the, the lake behind his house. He drops his book bags. He runs out to the, to the dock behind his house on his way, shoes and socks flying in the air, shirt comes off, he dives into the water. His mother watching through the window takes delight. She's just grinning, watching her son play in the water. He's swimming, but then her heart sinks because she sees in the middle of the lake an alligator. A gator who has now noticed her son and is moving toward her son. She bursts through the house and she screams at the son to come back to the dock, swim back. There's a gator and he begins to swim, but it's too late. The gator sees him and chases him. And just when she gets down to the deck or the dock, she reaches down and grabs his arms, but it's too late. The gator had grabbed his legs and a tug of war ensued between 
the gator who was struggling to pull the boy under the water and the mother who refused to let go and was, was pulling on her son with all of her might to save her child. A, a man who's driving by in a truck sees the struggle. He pulls over and it's Florida and everybody has a gun. So he, he takes aim and he shoots the alligator and he takes the boy and they go to the hospital where he spends the next several weeks in recovery healing from terrible wounds on his legs. A few weeks later, a newspaper reporter comes to interview the little boy as he's healing. And he says, do you mind if I see the scars on your, on your legs? And with pride, he pulled the pant leg up and he showed the scars where the alligator had attacked him. And the reporter said, my, those are, those are mighty big scars. And he said, oh, that's nothing. I've got some awesome scars on my arms. This is where my mom refused to let me go. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say that to you today because, beloved, the real power in your story is hidden in your scars. The real power in telling your story of faith is hidden in your scars, in those places in your life where God refused to let you go, refused to let you sink, refused to let the thing that had bitten you devour you. And that's not an easy thing to hear in our neck of the woods, is it? Just show your scars, be vulnerable, let people see your weakness. (laughs) Yeah, we don't do that very well in this neighborhood. But not only that, I'm aware that there is today, I guarantee you, someone here or in the Family Life Center or tuning in online for whom that is a very difficult prospect to consider, showing your scars, because the trouble is you may have gone through a thing recently and it's so recent that your wound has not yet healed into a scar. And the wound is open and it's still gaping And it's still bleeding. And there's a part of you that is still so vulnerable. How in the world can I tell my story when I don't even know how this thing is going to heal? I know. And I'm here to tell you, it is possible that healing takes a long time. And yet, because of God's grace... Something can be learned at every stage of the evolutionary journey of healing. From the moment it bit you to the moment you have a scar to tell about it. Something can be learned at every stage, including the one you find yourself in right this very moment. That's why today I want to call my message, Wounds, Stitches, and scars. Wounds, stitches, and scars, if you will turn your attention to the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians. Paul, in addressing the multiple wounds, stitches, and scars that he has borne in his life of faith, says in verse 24 of chapter 11, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one, Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked for a night and a day. I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, hungry and thirsty, often without food, cold and naked. And besides other things, I am under daily pressure because of my anxiety for all the churches Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast in the things that show my weakness. And then later in chapter 12, pick up in verse 7, the second half of verse 7. Therefore to me, to keep me from being too elated... A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about it, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace 
is sufficient for you. For power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content. (laughs) Strange. With weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then, say it with me, I am strong. I want to talk to you for just a moment about wounds. You know, a wound is different than a scar because a wound is something that has not yet healed. A wound is still open. A wound can still be bleeding. A wound can still be painful. And and when we are open and bleeding and gaping and vulnerable with our wounds... We sometimes wonder, what in the world could I possibly say about my story of faith that even matters because I'm hurting still so deeply? And just this. God shows up best in places where you are most wounded. Can I just say it that way? In fact, I want you to write it down and remember it. God meets us best where we are wounded most. God meets us best where we are wounded most. That's why in the Gospels, the Gospel stories are crammed with story after story of Jesus meeting the wounded, the vulnerable, those who are still hurting and bleeding in some sense of the the word, the blind, the deaf, the mute, the lame. He meets those who have been beguiled by leaders, those who have been shamed socially and shunned. He meets them in the midst of their woundedness because it's in the midst of woundedness that God has the capacity to do for us what we cannot do when we stand confidently on our own two feet. Maybe the most visible this can be seen is in the cross and resurrection of Jesus. And the cross of Jesus there is the quintessential demonstration of what God has attempted to do with humankind, meet us in our most vulnerable state. There he is. He's hung high and he's he's stretched wide. He's beaten, humiliated, naked, nail pierced. The perfect image of how God decides to meet any of us in the midst of our humiliation, in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of being crushed. And there upon the cross, I, 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 it's no wonder that those who witnessed that event would hear the echoes of Isaiah 5. He was wounded for our transgressions, he crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises, We are healed. Upon the cross of Christ, we see most clearly that God meets us best where we are wounded most. But maybe even, maybe even in the resurrection, we see it more clearly. You know, one of the mysteries that I've always struggled with throughout my Christian journey about the resurrection, one of the mysteries is that when God raised Jesus from the grave, He left five gaping wounds on his body, two in his hands, two in his feet, one in his side. And and for the longest time, I used to wonder, why would would God leave those marks, leave those wounds? If God was powerful enough to raise a man from the dead, why would God leave five gaping wounds for all the world to see? And then I realized, (laughs) thank you, Thomas. Thomas was one of his followers who was not there the day that Jesus first presented himself as the risen king. And all the other disciples tried to tell Thomas about it. In fact, as we read that story, they end up saying again and again and again, he is alive, we have seen him. In fact, the Greek, the verb that is used conveys an ongoing kind of action. The text says they kept on and on and on telling him that he's alive, but he said, I will not believe unless I I place 
my fingers in the nail prints of his hands and plunge my hand into the wound of his side, I will not believe. And the word there in Greek is pistis, which means I will not believe or have faith in. In other words, I can't have faith in someone who doesn't have wounds. Isn't that true for you and me? Just on a very basic level, aren't you more likely to be vulnerable with someone who's been vulnerable with you? Aren't you more likely to open up the secret recesses of your heart with someone who has done the same for you? Aren't you more likely to admit your failures and your sin and your brokenness to those who have been willing to share them with you? So Thomas shows up a week later and he confronts Jesus in the most beautiful artistic rendering of this encounter. I've shared it with you before because it's my favorite depiction of this moment. It's by Caravaggio. It's called The Incredulity of Thomas. Take a look at the picture. And you have Thomas there with a couple of other disciples and his hand reaching out, plunging his finger into the wounded side, the wounded side of Jesus. And of course, there's all kinds of debate about this piece of art. If you take another close-up look, you see the hand of Jesus. The question, of course, is, is Jesus pulling his hand away? Thomas, blessed are those who believe without seeing. Thomas, you shouldn't need faith. Uh, Faith shouldn't need evidence. Faith shouldn't need proof. Is he pulling it away? Or is he saying, yeah, come on. Come on. Feel, feel that I am alive. The debate continues, but the reality is, we have one more close-up on the on the last shot. The most moving part of this whole piece for me is that you see Thomas's finger plunged into the wound of Jesus, but with his other hand, he's holding on to his own side. Because right there in that posture, Thomas is demonstrating why Jesus was raised with wounds. Because it's in our wounded places that we most connect with God. It is in our wounds where God meets us best, in the place where his wound connects us to God's love. The truth of the matter is, how do I tell my story if my wound is still open? Well, maybe you don't. Maybe if you're in the season in which your wound is dominant and it's not closed up yet and you're still bleeding, you're hemorrhaging, you're hurting, it's still tender to the touch. Maybe you don't worry about putting words on your story. Maybe your job this season is to hold on to your wound and latch on to his. To latch on to Jesus in his wounded side so that in his wounding you are gradually made whole. That's what I think about when we come to church. Do you know that? That's an image that comes to my mind when I think about the church gathering. Well, you don't come here to just listen to good music and to hear tolerable sermons. You don't come here for a good Bible study and fellowship. You may come for all those things. They may occur when you're here, but that's not why you come. We come because every single one of us, a community of imperfect people with unfinished stories, we gather here every week to hold one hand on our own wound and grasp on to the wound of Jesus in his side. That's what we're doing right this moment. Every one of us surrounding the one who was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. That's what's happening. So when it comes to telling your story, if your stage that you're in is the wounded stage, then simply hold your wound and latch on to his. And in time, healing comes. I promise. That makes me want to say a few words, you know, about stitches. You know, Stitches represents another stage in the healing journey, right? Because when you're stitched up, that means the the bleeding has stopped. The trauma is initially over. The pain has changed a little bit. And it's time to begin giving a different kind of attention to your wounded place. See, when you have stitches, well, you take care of the sutures. You... You put ointment on it, maybe some neosporin, so it scars up nicely and not ugly, right? 
And maybe during the day you put a patch over it, and at night maybe you let it breathe a little bit. So you, you, you give a different kind of attention, and you begin to not simply suffer from the trauma of the thing that happened to you. You begin to reflect now on just what it was that did happen to you. You ever, you ever ask a child about a new set of stitches they have? You ever come to a child and say, hey, buddy, what happened? You've got, you've got stitches over your eyebrow. Then they begin to tell you the story. See, I was riding my bike, you know, and I had made this, this ramp, and when my wheel hit it, it kind of hit it wrong, and I went over the handlebars, and there was this brick, and I hit my head on it. It was gravel. Blood was everywhere. It was awesome. It was like everywhere. I was bleeding everywhere. I had to use my shirt. My shirt soaked with blood. We had to go to the ER, and there was this needle. It was like that long. But listen, I didn't cry. My little brother cried when he had his shot, but I didn't cry, but that's what happened. See, when you have stitches, you come to the stage in the evolution of your pain and healing where you start to not just suffer from the trauma, but interpret the trauma. Now you enter into a stage where you begin to tell the story about how the stitches got there. How did that get there? What happened? What went wrong? What did I learn? How am I going to keep this from happening again? You see, it's not just the body that gets stitches. Sometimes there are stitches for the soul. Anybody ever had stitches in your soul? Where the Lord had to sew you up in a place where you were so broken, and now in the same way that we have stitches on the body, now that you are in the season of healing from that thing, it's time to interpret that thing. What did happen? How did it get there? How do, how, do I, how, do I, how do I keep this scar from happening again? That, that's what happens when you get stitches. And in the stitches of the soul, those are the questions that you ask. Now, if anybody's ever had stitches in the soul, you know what I'm talking about. You get to a place where you ask questions about how it got there and what happened, and most importantly, where was God in the midst of it? See, if you're talking about telling your story and you're going to tell your story about the scar that you ultimately will develop, well, you have to begin by looking at the stitches and saying, this thing that happened to my life, how to get there, what went wrong, and where was God, and what was God up to in suturing me back together? There's this great story in the Gospels that's told the disciples are in a boat. They're on the sea. A storm comes. The, the rains fall. The winds blow. The, the, the waves lap against the side of the boat, and it's going to capsize. They are afraid for their lives. And so Jesus is taking a nap down below, and they wake him up. And are you not afraid? Do you not care that we are perishing, Lord? And Jesus, you know the story, comes to the to the surface, lifts his hands and says with his voice, peace, be still. And the winds cease and the rains stop and the waves calm and the sea is still like glass. And the chaos has shifted to a quiet. The only sound they can hear is the creaking of the wood on the hull of the ship. As it rocks gently now, the storm is over. And now they ask questions about it. The text says, they were amazed saying, who, who is this? That even the winds and the sea obey him. What I'm trying to tell you this morning is that if you're going to tell your story of faith and you've come through the wounding and you've been sutured in the soul by God, you know the storm's over, the wind has ceased, but now it's time for you to ask the questions. A little theological reflection is important in telling your story. Now it's time to ask the question, who is this who calmed the sea? Who is this who calmed the winds and the rains and has sutured up my soul. You want to tell your story of faith? It begins with latching on to the woundedness of Jesus. And in time, when he sutures you up in your broken places, you ask, how did it get there? What happened? And who is this that even the sea and the winds obey him? But can I give you one last tip about, <laughs> one last tip about stitches? 
If you know what it's like to have stitches in the soul, if you know what it's like to have gone through a thing and God rescued you and put you back together afterwards, I've got one tip for you during the season in which you are wearing stitches in the soul. You ready for it? Here's the tip. Don't pick at your stitches. Don't pick at your stitches. When we were kids, I had stitches all over, all the time. I got one with a, I hit a fence with my bike. My tooth came through my lip. I had stitches, and, but I couldn't stop chewing it, you know. I chew the stitches right up. We get stitches on our body. We kind of scratch at it. They'd come undone. The scar looks all weird now. And See, when you, if you pick at your stitches, see, you, you, sh- you shook people's hands and touched doorknobs. Your hands are dirty. You can get an infection in the places where your stitches are. And you can still pick the stitches of your soul. You know that? I'm sewn up now, but man, if this hadn't happened. Man, if, if I hadn't said that and, and, and he hadn't done that and she hadn't done the other and if they weren't so and, and I wouldn't, if I could have gone back and changed, if I could have, and you keep picking out of regret, you keep picking out of shame, you keep picking out of anger and guess what happens? You get an infection, the infection of resentment, the infection of unforgiveness. You keep, pick, don't pick at your stitches. Leave it alone. Because the God who sewed you up is up to something in the sutures. Leave it alone. Because then in time, guess what happens? Don't pick your stitches. In time, it becomes a scar. And that is where your story is best told. The best, most powerful part of your story is hidden in the scars and what he brought you through. And somebody in your life needs to know something about a scar that you have. Because do you know that there's not only healing in the scars of Jesus, but because he's the one who healed you, there's healing in your scars. Someone in your life needs to see your scar to remind them that there is a God who could suture them in the soul as well. I told you this story. I know. But it bears telling again, you know that uh, I've got some scars on my body. My brother and I had some health issues. He had many, many more. Had a younger brother, many, many surgeries, multiple surgeries over his life till he passed away at the age of 25. One of the surgeries he had, I had as well. It was called a diaphragmatic hernia. I was four years old. A diaphragmatic hernia is one of those surgeries where you have a hole in your diaphragm and your stomach and intestines and spleen, all those things move up through that hole. They collapse your lungs, move your heart out of place. It's a mess. And they had to go in and repair. They kind of crack you open, rearrange the puzzle pieces and zip you back up. That's what they did for me. And what it left was this pretty, pretty significant scar. Uh, so uh, to this day, it starts right about here on me goes all the way around to the top of my back where they had to kind of, you know, do the thing. About 25 years or so after that surgery, I was a youth pastor at a church in Virginia. And we would take our students over to the hospital from time to time to the children's wing because during those days, we could go in and minister in the waiting rooms. We would bring food. The students would play games with siblings who were waiting for their brothers and sisters to come out of surgery. We would talk to the adults, and if they were open to it, we'd pray with them. I walked over and noticed one woman in the corner, and this was the part of the waiting room where there was a smoking section in a hospital waiting room. The things that we did, man. And I walked over, and she's completely by herself, and she has an ashtray with a heap of cigarette butts. I mean, she's like lighting one right after the next. Her knee is just shaking. She's got like nicotine and caffeine coursing through her, her bloodstream, and she hadn't slept. She looks awful. I start a conversation with her. What's your name? Um, who, who do you have here? What, what's going on? Well, my son... My little boy is having a surgery, and, and, um, and the doctors say it's going to be okay, but I'm just, I, that's my, my baby in there. And well, do you mind me asking what, what kind of surgery, what is it, what's happening to him? And she says, it's a very rare condition, um, very rare, it's very dangerous. Um, it's called a diaphragmatic hernia. <laughs> yeah. And, and I said, you don't say. <laughs> and, and she went on to describe what it was. 
and how it worked and the hole in the stomach and the spleen and the thing. And, the, and I said, you know, would you, would you mind if I showed you something? <laughs> and then it got a little weird. <laughs> and, and so I just lifted the shirt on one side and I showed her my scar. I said, I had the same surgery when I was his age. Look, I'm doing okay. She wept. She needed a lot that day that doctors could provide, that friends could provide, the neighbors could provide. But one of the things that she really needed was to see a scar as the evidence that it really is going to be okay. That's how God heals us. By showing one another scars at times when we are so afraid, we're not sure we will make it to the other side of afraid. But the truth is, you know what? Hope rises on the east side of sorrow. Maybe today, maybe today God has led you to a place where it's time to get real. Time to become vulnerable. Time to confess to God and to the world that you are broken in a way that you cannot mend on your own. Maybe right where you are, sitting just as you are, it's time for you to pray. And if you don't know the words to pray, just borrow my words in your heart. Pray these words right this very moment. God, I am wounded. And I've tried to suture myself. I can't. So I reach out to latch on to your wound. Because you're the only thing that can heal mine. Hold on to me, Lord. And I will cling to you. And as you mend me and put me back together, Lord, I pray that you would show me who are you, Lord, that you would even be interested in me, that you would calm the storm, that you would settle the sea in my heart. Who are you? Because, Lord, I am here to follow you. I ask that you would forgive me of my sins, restore me in my broken and empty places, and you will be the Lord of my life from this day forward. Amen friends, if you're here today and you prayed that prayer just now, you know, you just took a huge step of faith. Your story that has been scripted along the way, the plot twists in your story that have led you to this very moment were not accidental. They're redemptive. He has brought you to a place for you to step out in faith and say, this is my story. I am no longer the Lord of my life, but I yield myself to the power of God's love. So if you've made that decision today, I want you to tell one of your pastors. So our pastors are coming to the front of the sanctuary and in the front of the Family Life Center at this time, because at the conclusion of our benediction, we will be here and will remain here to listen to you, to hold your hand, to pray with you to welcome you into the faith. But if you've been walking with Jesus for some time, but, but for whatever reason, you've been like, a, like a, a, a boat at sea with nothing tethering you to any family, any faith community, and you feel so isolated and alone, maybe today is your day to join this church, to step forward and talk to one of our pastors and say, I want to call JCBC my church family. I, what do I need to do to be a member here so that we can show our scars to one another and find mutual healing with each other and, and be a different presence in this world together? You join the church without waiting another week today. But friends, whatever it is that's happening in your life is not accidental. It's the stirring of God. And so now, as God has stirred us in worship this day, it's now time for us to, to come to the most important moment of worship, the moment when the gathered community becomes the scattered community, and we live outside of these walls in such a way that demonstrates to the world we actually believe what we affirm inside these walls. 
So as you're ready and if you're able, stand to your feet for the benediction. And now, beloved, may Christ go before you to prepare your way. May Christ go behind you. On the days that you fear and feel like retreating to encourage you one step further at a time. May Christ go to your right and Christ to your left, abiding closer than even a sister or a brother. May Christ go above you on the days that dark clouds roll in to remind you there really is one above the clouds. <clears throat> May Christ go beneath you, girding you with confidence and re removing all forms of fear. But mostly, may Christ go in you, transforming you from the inside out until your hearts beat in rhythm with his. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Our students are going to come back and help us with the closing song just now. How can I say thanks for the things you have done for me? Things so undeserved. Yet you gave to prove your love for me The voices of a million angels Could not express my gratitude All that I am or ever hope to be I owe it all to thee To God be